So today we're going to be going through actually two new processes in this very short period. The first is how to deal with problems that look like these. The nice part is that you basically already know the process on how to deal with these. It's just a matter of seeing how we approach ones that look this big. We basically start by taking a look at what the square root is, because all this stuff is inside a square root, of each of these four parts individually. And so it's like we're taking this and turning it into the square root of 50. This is at least how I'm thinking about it, even if I don't write it out this way, but you can write it out this way. Square root of x squared, square root of y to the 6, and square root of z to the ninth. We're basically going to be simplifying each of these four pieces individually. All right, and so let's go ahead and start tackling that. Uh, for the root 50, remember how we simplify the square root of a number? It's been a little bit longer since we did this, so you might want to go back and review your notes if you're rusty. We're looking for the biggest perfect square that goes into 50. In this case, that's 25. And so that's where we turn it into the square root of 25 times the square root of 2, because 25 times 2 is 50. And then I turn each of my variables into fractional exponents. So like the square root of x squared is x to the power of 2 over 2. Square root of y to the 6 is y to the 6 over 2. Square root of z to the ninth is z to the 9 halves. And so notice, the variables are doing just what we did yesterday. And so we're combining the old skill with the new skill here. All right. Last thing from here is really just some cleanup. So the square root of 25 is 5. And the root 2, it just stays a root 2 there. And now tackle the x's. x to the 2 over 2 is x to the power of 1. But of course, I don't need to write to the power of 1. That's just x. y to the 6 over 2. 6 over 2 reduces down to be 3. So that becomes y to the power of 3 z to the 9 halves. Here, this is one that we learned brand new yesterday. What do we do when it's not a whole number? 9 halves, that's the same as 4 and a half. Well, 4 and a half, I'm going to save myself a little bit of writing, and I'm going to say, well, I know from yesterday's work, that means that it's z to the 4th times the square root of z. Now, to get our final answer, we just want to <coughs> tidy this up. We want to put all the stuff that's outside of the radical all together. Because I don't want multiple square roots in here. I just want to have one root. So, the 5 is outside, the x is outside, the y cubed is outside, and z to the 4th is outside. So then, what's left inside? The 2 and the z are inside the radical at this point. And then this is it. This is our final answer. So notice what the process is. We're basically just breaking this big original square root up into a whole bunch of individual ones. Now, do you have to show every single one of these steps? Probably not. But I would expect if I were looking at your paper to see at least a couple of them. But the way you think about it is going to determine which of those steps is the most useful for you. Of course, if you have any trouble with it, I always suggest show more steps. Because the more work you show, the clearer the math becomes. All right, for the second one, we're going to approach it the same basic way. Where I'm going to be doing the cube root of 16, the cube root of x to the 12th, and so on and so forth. Now, when we do this, for the cube root of 16, that means that we have to look for the biggest perfect cube that goes into 16, because it's cube root this time, not square root. Now, as we think about our perfect cubes, of course, one cubed is one, but everything, I can pull one out of it. Uh, two cubed is eight. Well, notice eight does go into 16, so that's a possibility. Uh, three cubed is 27. That's too high. That obviously doesn't go into 16, so it's got to be the eight. And so just like when we did our square roots, I'm going to break my cube root up into two pieces. Oops, wrong number in the wrong place. There we go. 
I turn the cube root of 16 into the cube root of 8, because that's the one that gives me a whole number, times the cube root of 2, because again, 8 times 2 gives me the 16 here. And those two numbers always have to multiply to whatever my original number was. All right, and then we're going to simplify the others as well. So I'm going to have to be doing x to the power of 12 thirds, y to the power of 2 thirds, and z to the power of 8 thirds. All right, a little bit of cleanup. The cube root of 8, remember I chose 8 because it's a perfect cube. The cube root of 8 is just 2. So it's going to be 2 cube root 2, because the 2 that was inside the cube root just stays as it was. We couldn't simplify it at all. Then, the x to the 12 thirds becomes x to the 4th. No fraction left. Awfully convenient. Uh, y to the 2 thirds. Notice that one's not top heavy. It's not an improper fraction. So I can't turn it into a mixed number. So really, all I can do is just write it back as a radical, which, of course, is the radical we started with, cube root of y squared. You notice you probably didn't need to go through the fractional exponent step on that one to see that. But if you do, it's fine. And then z to the 8 thirds? Well, z to the 8 thirds, of course, is z to the power of 2 and 2 thirds. I want to take that power of 2 thirds, though, and turn that back into a radical. And so it's going to be cube root of z squared. Last step. Everything that's outside of the radical stays outside the radical. So I collect all of those and put them together. So notice that's going to be the 2, the x to the 4th, and the z squared. Notice there were no y's outside of the radical. So there's not going to be any y's outside the radical in our final answer. Then we go to the radical. Now when you write the radical, remember all of these from the original problem down to the work we are doing here, all of these were cube roots. One mistake I see people make often is we get into such a groove with this that we write the radical symbol and forget to write that it's a cube root. So pay attention to that one because it's a very common mistake that I do see. All right, and then everything that's inside the cube root stays inside the cube root. So that's the 2, the y squared, and the z squared. And then we're done. So this is, it seems like a very involved process, but you'll notice that this is really using the exact same stuff as what we were doing before. All we're doing is just putting it into one single problem that looks very, very complex. All the other stuff was kind of leading into it. Now, I did say this was just the first of two skills we are going through today. The other one is going to be a little bit of detailing work on how we simplify some of these types of problems. Add this into your notes. And then we'll take a look at how we can use those to go one step further. As you take a look at these notes that you put down, some of this should seem familiar. Like all exponents are positive. We talked about when simplifying these, we had to get rid of the negative exponents. Remember, the negative exponents are the ones that flip whatever it's attached to in a fraction. Uh, no fractional exponents. We also can't have a fraction in our exponent. So that's like what we've been doing recently with turning them into radicals. But there's an additional detail to that that we haven't seen yet. And that is that we actually can't leave a radical in the denominator of our answer. So I can't have something over a square root, for instance, in my final answer if it's going to be considered simplified. So that's what we're going to be looking at next. How do I simplify something that looks like this? Go ahead and write this problem down. It's a Kind of the most simple example, so it's a good one to start with. We're going to be simplifying 1 over the square root of x here. Now, what our goal is here is to turn it into something where the bottom is no longer the square root of x. We're actually going to be able to turn it into just a plain old x instead of square root of x. Now, in order to do that, let's kind of go over to the side and think this through. I need to take square root of x... And I'm dealing with a fraction here. Remember, the only things I'm allowed to do to a fraction without changing what it equals is either multiply or divide both top and bottom of the fraction by the same thing. Now, we can't divide here, but we can multiply top and bottom of this fraction by something. So it's a matter of figuring out what do I multiply them by. 
So I'm saying root x times what is going to equal just x. Now, if you're not sure, we can actually use the fractional exponents to think it through. Because, of course, that's x to the power of 1 half. And I want it to equal x, which, of course, is just x to the power of 1. When I multiply the x's, I add their exponents. So 1 half plus what equals 1? Notice, I'm adding here. I can tell. Some of you are thinking about multiplying. 1 half plus what equals 1? I'm adding it. So it has to be 1 half. Because 1 half plus 1 half equals 1. Well, that means that I would have to multiply the square root of x by the square root of x, because, of course, that's x to the 1 half. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by square root of x. Show that work with your problem. A little side note here. This works beautifully where we're basically just multiplying the square root by itself because it's a square root. Think ahead. If this was a cube root instead, this would be a one-third. Notice multiplying it by another cube root wouldn't do it. We'd actually need to multiply by something else to make it equal one. So this is unique to square root where it works out so nicely. We can still do it with the other ones, but you're going to find they're a little bit more complicated. All right. Now, if I actually go ahead and do that, multiply 1 times root x on the top. So if I multiply those together, that, of course, gives me just root x. And on the bottom, when I multiply the square root of x times the square root of x, of course, that's what we are going for. We know that's going to equal x. So then this is our final answer, the square root of x over x. We're able to rewrite it in an equivalent form, which no longer has the radical in the bottom of the fraction. Now I want to practice that with some other variations of this. The root x is a nice general one, but we can apply it to all these other cases. So write down both of these. All right, so for that first one, I want to get rid of the radical on the bottom. When it was root x on the bottom, we multiply by root x. Well, the beautiful thing about starting with root x is x can be anything. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom of this one by that same square root on the bottom. In this case, square root of 3. And so top and bottom both by root 3. On the top, 4 times root 3 is just 4 root 3. On the bottom, 3, I'm sorry, root 3 times root 3 gives me 3. Just like root x times root x equaled x. And that's our final answer. We're done there. A little side note here. Why is the rule that we can't leave a radical in the bottom? Well, root 3 is a big, ugly decimal, right? If you weren't just plugging numbers in your calculator and having to do something by hand, trying to do 4 divided by that crazy decimal would be really challenging. But if you have some crazy decimal that you're dividing by a whole number, it's actually much easier math to do if you're trying to do this stuff by hand. And so that's why they made it that rule, because it's easier to do when you have to do it the long way. All right, let's go ahead and tackle the next one now, 20 over root 5x. And again, even though there's more than one thing inside the square root, I'm still going to multiply top and bottom by that same square root. And so I get 20 root 5x on the top, and on the bottom, I just have a 5x. Now, in this case, though, we're not done. Because you'll notice that by getting rid of that radical, it all of a sudden created a situation where we can reduce our fraction. You'll notice this 20 and 5 will reduce. I can divide top and bottom of the fraction by 5. So we're going to do that. 20 divided by 5 is 4. The root 5x is unaffected because I'm dividing the whole 20 root 5x by 5. By dividing the 20 by 5, I divide that whole term by 5. And on the bottom, 5x divided by 5 is just x. This is now our final answer. Now, you might be wondering, why didn't we do that at the start? Why didn't I reduce these? Well, you notice the 20 was outside the radical at that point, but the 5 was inside of the radical. 
We, we can't do that. There's not a way to simplify that. And you'll notice that if we had done that, it would have given us 20 root 5x over x. It wouldn't have been the same answer, just to help bring that idea home that we have to simplify it first. All right, these are the last two that we're going to be doing today. So go ahead and write down and simplify each of these. Start them on your own first, then we'll go through them. All right, so I've started each of these because the first step is always the same. If you have a radical in the bottom, multiply top and bottom by that radical. And now I'd look to simplify, but in these two problems, both, I've given you one additional layer of simplification that can be done because you'll notice the square root of 200, I can simplify that radical. The square root of 200, well, the biggest perfect square that goes into it is 100, so that's root 100 times root 2. So that whole thing equals 10 root 2. Well, if I multiply 15x by 10 root 2, that gives me 150x root 2. And so, yes, we want to simplify that as well. Now I'm going to go ahead and reduce my fraction. And so that's going to give me 3x root 2, because I'm dividing top and bottom by 50, over 4. In case you're curious, could we have simplified that root 200 at the very start? Yes, you could. No real difference between it. It's personal preference. Something similar happens on the second one now. You'll notice the root 36x simplifies because the square root of 36 is 6. 8 times 6 is 48. So it becomes 48 root x over 36x. And then I'm going to reduce that. You notice top and bottom in this case can divide by 12. And so if I do that, it gives me 4 root x over 3x. And then that is done. 